Thank you for coming back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the closing ceremony of the 2014 edition of the Global Media Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, today seems to be the day of the strong women. We've had one this morning. We'll have another one now as the keynote speaker for the closing ceremony. And um, yesterday we had a lady with a big name. This big name is known internationally, but this lady is a friend of Germany. Dr. Auma Obama has been uh, coming to Germany quite regularly. Sort of some part of the education took place here. Then she went back to Kenya, worked for CARE, came back to Germany, and now she has founded her own organization, Saudi Ku Powerful Voices. And you might ask yourself, what is she doing here? Now, there's an important part of what we've been talking about the last couple of days, which is empowerment, education. And those are two aspects which can be helped by digitization. How that is supposed to work, you will share with us now, share with us your views, your vision, and take us along on the road to digitization and to education, also in Africa. Dr. Obama. Thank you, Connie, for the introduction. I hope she hasn't promised you too much. I'll do my best uh, with what I have to present here. Uh, my topic is supposed to be education as a human right in the digital world. Um, bear with me, because when I uh, present, I usually talk as the voice of the young people and the families that I work for and I work within my foundation. So uh, it may not be within the mainstream of what's been talked about in the media today, but I think it'll relate, hopefully, in ways that we can find a, a, a possibility for conversation afterwards. What I would like to say is the idea of a human right, education as a human right, when you think of the digital world, I would like to say that instead of calling it a right, I would call it an opportunity. And we all have to see it as an opportunity because the new media has changed our world. There's no doubt about that. I was in a plenum uh, just to have a peep and see what's going on. And the first thing that was talked about was who's tweeting, who has uh, posted, etc., etc. That was the question that was asked immediately. And I said, wow, what an opportunity. What real life now time are we able to communicate and access information and exchange information that already is a reason to say that it's an opportunity a great great opportunity and also the idea of information education and education we can't separate it anymore for me education is not talking about formal education it's not talking about informal education in the ways of ex ex extracurricular education it's talking about information receipt of information be it to, that young people get information, that children get information, or that adults get information. It is one and the same, information and education in my mind, and the way I see it and in the work that we do. The big things that we see visually around the information that we get, especially around young people, I repeat again, I'm talking in the context of what young people are experiencing in the world today, is the mobile phone, and the computers, the smartphones, the laptops, the iPads, etc., etc. The phone in particular, the handy, as they call it in Germany, the mobile phone is accessible almost to everybody, even the poorest of the poor. And I come from Kenya, I can tell you, before there was a mobile phone and you tried to get a phone in your house, it was very, very difficult for business and for private life. And you ended up paying a lot because people would tap into your phone and steal your units or whatever they were called, and you'd be paying for the neighbor and the neighbor's neighbor and the neighbor, other neighbor. With electricity, it's still happening in the slums. But as far as the mobile phone, we suddenly had our destiny in our own hands and could make decisions around what happens and how we collect, exchange, and receive information without anybody getting in the way. We cut to the chase, get rid of the middleman. And that's what improved business, for example. A lot of entrepreneurs have been able to keep their businesses going because they have a mobile phone. We have in the medical field, in agriculture, that information is being passed directly to farmers, directly to clinics and, and dispensaries and medical uh, places that are very, very rural, and they can get their information and get their work done without having to have some complex, very expensive system in place in order to do their work. So again, seeing it as an opportunity. A great, great opportunity, and not just a great opportunity, but an opportunity at the press of a button. You just have to click and do whatever it is we're all doing on our phones, and we're there. Fast, direct, 
Without anything between us, we have access to the world. So I'm going to contradict a little bit what was said earlier uh, when I peeped into the session around talking, when you talk about the right of access to information, we do, yes, have that problem. But on the other hand, we also have access to a lot of information through the fact that we have gadgets now that allow us to have this information. And, I, and, and in that context, I say very many times, even having access to information is a problem because it, it requires effort to take in that information, to collect that information, to get the correct information. There's a level of laziness also around the information we get and what we do with it. I use my own country again as an example in Kenya. Very many times in, in times that have passed, there have been situations where it's like it's really difficult, government issues, mismanagement, corruption, etc., etc. Let me tell you something. Just through the newspaper, forget about digital. Most of the times we know what's going on. We know what's happening in our countries. We can read between the lines in the papers. We have information that we have access. The problem is, what do we do with that information? Does it mean we get active? Does that mean we get critical? Does that mean that we now start participating in really making sure that that information that we get leads to us making some change happen in our societies? So I question that, and I question it for you as media people, because it's all very well to get really sad about the fact that people can't access information, information is one-sided, information is, is, is difficult to, to digest, but there's also the other side of the coin where there's a lot of information there, but what do we do with information? Let's leave Kenya behind. Let's use the example of Germany, where I lived for many, many years. And I had the problem that very many times people would ask me questions and I'd be like, really? You really think we still live on... I'm, the, I'm exaggerating. No, we don't live on trees. Nobody asked me that one. But, you know, there were questions asked where I'd say, you guys have so much information and you don't know that? You know, if you're not, you didn't learn it in school because they're not going to teach you about Kenya in school, but you have access to internet, you have access to radio, you have access to TV, many, many channels. Why do you not have that information? You know, there's no excuse why you shouldn't have that information. But it's because people didn't make the effort to, to, to read, to, to digest, to verify, to differentiate the information that they got. So that's something that I'm pushing back at all of you in the discussion around information, uh, dissemination, creation, receipt, what conversations are having around that? How we as individuals handle information that we get. We're getting a lot of it, especially within the digital world. We're getting so much information, and this information is indiscriminate in terms of the content and in, in terms of who receives it. And that's the best part for me, because it doesn't matter what race you are, what, what social background you have, how wealthy you are, how educated you are, you can all access information. Now, I've just said that really generalizing because when I come back to the kids I work with in the rural area, they cannot because we don't have internet access. We don't have computers. We don't have laptops. And some of us don't even have phones and mobiles and all that. So in that context, you then differentiate and say, okay, these guys don't have access because they don't have the equipment that is needed around the information in order to access that information. So in, in, and, and I'll talk about that a bit later, what we try to do around that. But for all of us here in this space that we're, I'm talking in now, and for the mainstream, a good majority nowadays in the bigger cities and in the urban areas, we do have access to information. And we have access to information in a discriminate way where then the, 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 you, you have to say, no excuse for ignorance because you can access the information. There's a lot of it, so that becomes a problem in itself to an extent, but in my opinion, again, better too much information than no information. I think you would agree with me on that one, because what happens then, the problem is that we then have to be responsible with that information. We have to work. It causes effort to, to, to digest and to, to, to use that information. And here, an appeal, an appeal to the media, what do the media do with information, and what is the information about? What is the quality of the information? Why? Why are we receiving this information? And some, I just, in this uh, um, film, this one person said, I look in the media, I read the newspaper to find out what kind of lies they're going to tell me. Very, very cynical. But actually, some people don't even read newspapers because they say, well, it's not telling me the truth and it just depresses me. So that's a challenge to the media in terms of what are you trying to create with the information that you pass on? Where, for example, somebody, a, a newspaper person will say, well, or a media person, I'm going to, I can't really come and cover your work that you're doing because it's really not that interesting. It's so mainstream. Everything is going well. Is there a problem? Is there something going wrong? Then I'll be able to report on it because then people want to read that. That's more exciting. 
So again, the challenge around, are we informing people? Are we, are we teaching people? Or are we just putting it out there for people to be able to decide on their own? But then the responsibility is around, what are we doing with the information that we're, we're then passing on? So again, it's cause, it's effort. Learning is effort. Education is effort. It always is. It can be good effort, it can be fun. Just like somebody goes to the gym and does a workout and says, wow, that was great, my adrenaline rush, I love it. But it's always somehow effort. You know, and that's something that we have to always include in the conversation around uh, information and whether people access information or not. Because you can give people a lot of information and they do nothing with it. Like I said, the, the qu situations where I had questions asked of my country and myself as an African in Germany or in England where I wondered, do these people not read newspapers or even have access to information? Because I learned that in school. Okay? So again, inf important uh, around the quality. Um, Another thing that I find with the, the digital media, which for me is, is a godsend, again an opportunity, is the fact that it's given people a new channel, an alternative channel to education. Not just in terms of e-learning, but in terms of information collection and then also job creation. A lot of, and again, I'm using as a vice for Kenya because Kenya, I think, is also one of the ones who are the pioneers and really up forward with, 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 with uh, internet and, and e-learning and internet application uh, development, et cetera, et cetera, that it's possible now that young people are having businesses that they have started on the web, and this is not just in Kenya, this is globally, that they've started on the web and created jobs for themselves and for others. So it means that access to education has become something much, much uh, bigger and much more accessible than it was before, in my time, before internet was so, so big. I give away my age by saying that. Um, so that's another plus, another opportunity that we have through uh, digital media, through having access to the internet, through having access uh, to, to, the, to the web. Again, I repeat, uh, is what we do with it. The idea of responsibility, what is our role as media people, as people who are decision makers with regards to what happens to that information. A small example around the foundation that I run is that um, we deal very, very much with education. It's a very big part of the work we do. And what I'm going to call it here, just kind of like to give it some connection around uh, the, the idea of education as a formal form of, of, of accessing information and as opposed to informal, I'm calling it a socialize, socialization education. Um, and what, what I mean with that is we work with young people around them discovering who they are as individuals and that's why we call it powerful voices. And voices, I think, for the media, it's about communication. Whether the voice is coming from the radio, from the TV, through the internet, through, 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 through the written word, it's all about communicating. It's all about, all about using your voice. We work with young people who don't, aren't even aware that they are allowed to use their, not even allowed, that they have a voice to use. Because especially the rural communities we work with, because we work with rural kids and we work with slum kids. And most of them are in families that are larger, and even if they're not larger, a child is more to be seen than to be heard. Um, and because of that, they don't have the feeling that they can use their voice and say what they really think, and they don't know how to do this. So we work with them in a way that we have three very, very important words that work for us, light, voice, and fire, around the idea of self. Light for the guys in media who do film. We talk about, in connection with light, about being seen. Show the light of your life through your eyes. Because young people who are disadvantaged don't often look you in the eye. For those of you who work with kids who are disadvantaged, when you try to talk to them, they look over your shoulder to the other side. What, that drives me really crazy because I like the contact. But they don't look at you because they don't feel that, they feel they're being disrespectful. And they also feel that, they mustn't make themselves too aware because it's like being disrespectful for, for being too obvious, too, too there. So they make themselves smaller. So we tell them you have to be seen, so you have to look people in the eye. Very difficult in our culture because actually it is a matter of respect. You need to look down. And we're working with that around trying to get the grown-ups to also accept that kids can look you in the eye without being disrespectful. And, as for, and why we say that is because if you look somebody in the eye, and I could do this test with you, but I, I was given a time, things I won't, um, you look somebody in the eye, you see a light shine in that person's eye. Film people know that. You watch a film, black and white, when they're showing the film, the light is lit so that it shines in your eyes so the lights have a spark. And that spark gives that picture life. 
So if you're watching the film and there's no light in those people, they look dead. And what do you do when people die? You cover their eyes. The light is out. So we work with the kids around telling them, you have to, we have to see that light in your eye. We have, you have to be seen in order for people to take you, uh, to, to, uh, to acknowledge you. So that's very, very important. You have to be heard. Again, we can take the media again. The voice, we need to hear that voice. You have to be articulate. You have to articulate yourself in order for people to be able to hear what you have to say and take you seriously. And you have a right to be articulate. You have a right to be heard. You have to be aware of your own potential and your surroundings. You have to be aware of your own power and your own abilities. You know, don't fear that strength in yourself. Bring it out. Because if you can bring that out, it's not just the light in your eyes that shine, it's also the light within you that comes out. And being aware means also comprehending. Because we've talked about the media, you can give people so much information, but if they don't understand it, they can do nothing with it. But if you're aware and you are able to appreciate, that means you, a level of intelligence of knowing what's going on with you, you then are able to comprehend. And by being able to comprehend, you can then act, and you have to act. We insist that you take action. One, because it's your life and you are your future. You have to do it for yourself. It doesn't matter where you come from. And that's one of the things we tell the kids. Poverty is no excuse. Ignorance is no excuse. That's for the media people and people who have access to information. It's no excuse. You can't say I didn't know. And that's the worst thing. People go to jail for saying they didn't know. In fact, I have a fear for that because I often am like, oh, okay. I didn't really know. I was driving too fast. Sorry, Mr. Officer. No. The law is the law you ought to know. You did it, your driving license, etc., etc. So ignorance is no excuse. Participation. You have to be actively involved. And by being actively involved and having all the other things as well, the comprehension, the articulation, you can then talk. You can be party at the table and you can talk. Critical debate was talked about. You're able to, be, to talk about things. You have the information. And you can then participate in a way that you can also challenge situations. Because a lot of our young people don't challenge. And I think it's not just our young people in Kenya or other parts of the world where I've been working in, with, with young people, even in Europe and in the U.S., very often young people, and the attitude of the young people here is a little, is interesting in a way because the idea is that, ah, can't be bothered. In German, null Bock. But behind that, what's really hiding is, I don't really want to challenge the situation. It's, I, I don't know how to deal with it. Let me move away from it. So they withdraw, outwardly looking quite strong and sometimes very scary if you see a bunch of them at the shops and you're trying to walk by them and you're on your own, you think they're going to make fun of you. But actually, in reality, to me, in the work that I do, it's a similar, this kind of fear of being part of the conversation because I don't have the tools to converse. I don't have the tools to be part of the discussion around what happens with my life because really it's about our every individual life. And that's what we try and work with the young people uh, to try and to help them get through the situations they're in and be informed around the situations that they're in in order to make the right decisions to improve their lives. So we create this platform and it's all about communication, every single bit of it. But it also has to be informed communication. And that's where we then come with, 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 with terms that we try to, to work through and define. And we try to redefine terms. And the terms that we're trying to redefine in order to fight this victim mentality, this sense of, 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 of being, in, being powerless, this passiveness, is around defining terms, around, uh, terms like poverty. What does it mean to be poor? Just because I live in a hut and I don't have running water and electricity doesn't mean I'm poor. Because if I have 10 acres of land, you're, you're much richer than I am. And people are not aware of them because the land is not appreciated. Why do I want to be a farmer? The only people who are farmers are people who have given up. They, didn't, they went to the city and got nothing. They're failures. Because I want to go to the city and have a white collar job. So we redefine what poverty means and what it means with relation to what they actually have so that they open their eyes to see that they actually have assets and resources that they can use in order to improve their lives. So opening their eyes to that. We try to redefine the term development aid. I work in the human sect humanitarian sector, I always say. Development aid, to me, means nothing initially. Because what are we developing to or from? And I've always wondered why this term was always used all over the world. With Africa, it's called development aid. What are we developing? To what? Can we not define these terms? We're talking about communication. We're talking about language, media people. This is an appeal to you. Development aid to what? And we change that and say, if you want to talk about development, talk about economic development, social development, socioeconomic development. 
ecological development, but you have to develop to something, anything, but there has to be, it's going somewhere, it's got to be active. That way we can change the mindset of the people because that's what we have to do in order to improve people's lives, especially in relation to what was, in my case, development aid, to move it to a place where it's sustainable economic development. We define it. Because what is happening around these young people and the disadvantaged families is that they are having problems because financially they cannot look after themselves. And that's what we're calling poverty. But they're financially not able to look after themselves because they don't see their assets, they don't see their resources, they don't have the know-how and, and, and the, the exposure to know how to, to improve their situation. But they, once they are made aware of that, they start looking at themselves differently, the idea of self and who you are, and they start looking at their surroundings differently and their own participation in what happens in their life and take ownership of their own destinies. That's what we try to do in order to change the situation for the, for the for young people we work with. And, and one of the, the, again, with regards to, to uh, what they can do with their lives, and again, because we work with rural young people who really are pretty reserved and really are blinded to what is available around them, where I, I've been to my grandmother and said, look, how come we can't feed ourselves in these areas where these young people live? They can't feed themselves, but they have land. And her answer, simple answer of a 93-year-old woman is they've forgotten. They forgot how to feed themselves. Something came in between, dare I say, the philanthropy of we're going to give them, we need to give them fish, we need to teach them how to fish, and they forgot how to look after themselves. And they have to relearn that open their eyes again and appreciate what it is that they have. So fighting against that, the victim mentality, the fact that we think we can't do it for ourselves, and the fact that our young people think they can't do it for themselves. So you can imagine when I came along as an African woman in this rural area to try and change or, or challenge the situation, the question is, what are you going to give me? I learned this term in my work about sitting allowance. Some of you may know that that you do a course around teaching people how to improve their lives and say, well, I'll come and I'll participate, but you have to pay me. It's called sitting allowance. I'm like, okay, I'm paying you to help you learn to improve your life. Okay, that's new. And I'm like, no, we don't do that. So then initially they're like, okay, we're going away. We're not interested. Our kids are not getting anything from this. But some are still doing it. Some are still paying the sitting allowance. And what it's called is we've got to be politically correct. And unfortunately, and fortunately for me, as an African, I can go and, or really because I'm part of the communities there, I can go and say, well, you guys, you're getting none of that. You can go away. We'll work with the two, three people who are willing to stay. The rest of you, goodbye. We're paying you nothing. But very many times, foreigners, especially European foreigners, American foreigners, feel a bit uncomfortable and they're like, well, you know, we can't, it's not PC. And no, don't allow it. Well, we have this money and we've got to give, finish and spend it by then and then. No, you're not helping the people. Then you have an agenda that has nothing to do with these people. And both of you are kind of fooling each other. At the moment, only German expressions come to mind, so I can't even say it in English. Huh? Man, einander. You know, for those who speak German, you're just, or in English, not a very good term to say, but you're taking the pace, really. Really, if I'm going to be teaching you, you know, and you expect me to pay you, and then there's no respect. There's no respect because the people know this is something that's going to finish. That's why let me get the money. And that's the problem that's happened with development aid is that the people, want, it's a one-off. It's quick. It's like ice cream. It melts immediately after. But for that moment, it tastes so good. But after you, first of all, you're thirsty. You need too much ice cream. Or you, and then you have no food. So what's the point? And then you put on weight. If you're a woman, you want to think about that. You know what I mean? So it's got to be, there's got to be a conversation happening that's real. And it's a real conversation around, first of all, what we tell our young people is before you start thinking about working with us in terms of development, sustainable economic, economic development, you must ask the question, what is in it for me? Why am I involved? What do I want? And that is about being informed. Again, bringing in the media. Being informed about what it is we are doing and what you're going to get from it, and what your participation is going to be. What's your return on investment? As, 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 you know, in, as academic as that may sound, what is it for you? 
And where's the transparency in this communication, in this work that we do together? I have a lot of places where I work with organizations that find it difficult to work with the communities because they say, well, we really can't really work so well because there's a, a misunderstanding. But very often the misunderstanding comes because the levels of communication and dialogue that's going on be, until it gets to the actual group, the, 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 the target group, there's so many levels that until it gets to the target group, the target group are just doing what they're being told to do. You know, And that is something that we have to move away from. There has to be a real dialogue happening if there's going to be real communication, real information exchange that will result in real implementation of things that deliver on what both sides want. If that doesn't happen, there's, it's going to continue what's been happening for a long, long time. And I think I can comfortably say that with all of the development aid that we're doing, there's a sense of fatigue because we keep doing it and doing it. And my God, these guys, they're still poor. They still can't manage, you know? They're still struggling, and I still feel guilty. And that's not just from people in Europe and the US. We also have philanthropists in Kenya, you know, and in other parts of the world who help, the church, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody's tired, huh? Everybody's tired, and I keep saying, well, we can stop being tired if people stop, start saying, let's be honest with each other. Let's talk about what the situation really is. Because actually, when I look at our young people, we say we only succeed when these young people grow up to be adults that are financially independent and are capable of living their lives in the community as responsible adults who can pay their own way, to put it quite, you know, uh, local. They just need to be able to pay, and they want to do that as well. Initially, until we come along and start giving them things for free, then they're like, well, why should I bother? Welfare system. Why should I bother? It costs me more effort to do this and this and get a little bit of money. And when they're going to give it to me, just like that, why should I bother? And that's the problem that we have. And that's where we say we move away. Well, not quite, because my team will kick me if I say that under the table. We don't move away from philanthropy. We don't move away from charity. But it has its place. We must move towards economic sustainability. In all the work we do, even in the humanitarian sector, it has to be economically sustainable. That means that all the work we do, we have to work with our target groups in such a way that they can also finally pay their way. Whether it's around projects that we're doing or, or activities that we're doing, we have to look at a way to make it something that can last longer. Because when it's economically sustainable, it goes on for longer. And then we have to then say, where is the place of philanthropy? Apart from immediate uh, you know, relief around uh, crisis and, 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 and things like tsunami, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to see where philanthropy takes its place. Because if we just base everything on the fact that somebody feels has some strong feelings about uh, Africa or strong feelings about Asia or where, wherever they're taking their money and really feel inclined, they want to donate, they want to give money, when they don't feel like it anymore, it anymore then what? And that's what ends up happening, that you have projects going on that I have experienced myself three years, four years, five years even, where when the money ends, everything stops. Staff are sent home, the beneficiaries are told, well, hmm, that's as far as we could go. We really are very sad about it. even really, really good programs that are functioning. Because the, the basis on which it's built on sand because it's been built on philanthropy and not on the idea of sustainable economic development. And that's where you have to move it into the econ economic sphere. It has to be something to do. It has to be within the economic value chain. It cannot be philanthropy. Philanthropy is very needed because operationally we do need it, but alone, philanthropy alone is not sustainable for economic development. I'm not calling it development aid economic development in any community. And why, I ask the question always because I say, why is that the case when we're dealing with the African continent, for example, let me just take the African continent around the idea of development aid. Why is it around philanthropy when actually, if we're honest with each other, it's about trade? Because at the end of the day, if I'm trying to get a job and I want to join the, the market, the job market, it's about employing me, make me part of what makes my economy grow. So then let's not talk about aid, let's talk about trade. So we want trade, not and we don't want, I dare say, just fair trade. We want real trade, because fair trade is something that was created in the West, and there's nothing wrong with it. Please don't misunderstand me. But the idea, of what is fair? I still need that to be defined, because fair is around 
the, the farmers are getting better money, it's, it's uh, ecologically better, it's, it's uh, grown well, and all the other things that go towards it, which is all very, very legitimate. But the idea initially is about having real trade. I have something you want, let's talk about how much it's going to cost you and how much it's going to cost me and how much I'm going to get. That's the conversation that needs to start happening on that continent and everywhere else where we keep going in and talking about development aid. Let's talk about economic development. Let's start having the honest conversation about how we relate to each other and how the economic value chain works for everybody from the product to, to, to the end product, from production to the end product. It doesn't matter what product it is, because at the end of the day, our young people just say, well, just pay me for what I do. You don't have to build the school for me. Okay, maybe you do, because we don't have enough money. I'm just being a bit uh, provocative here. But the school's fine and good, but actually, if you pay me enough money, maybe we could build it ourselves. So that conversation needs to be had around what kind of trade are we having with each other. What is the responsibility, regional and global? What, what do we own of what's going on, and how do we fit into the decision-making uh, arena? It has to be a partnership, and it has to be an honest partnership. That's, that's why when I talk about it, I'm not talking about giving concessions to the, the, the South or to the so-called developing countries. No, they have to just be able to compete at a level that it's an eye-to-eye -eye level. So it, maybe you'll rip them off. I'm saying you, maybe that's a corporate or whatever. You know, maybe they, you get a better deal where the other one has less, but that's how the, the, the economy works. That's how capitalism in which we function works. And that's what the question the young people are asking, is the ones who are no longer wanting to be helped, and those are the ones we are creating in Saudi Kuh. We don't want to be helped. We want to help ourselves, but we want to be able to have a platform where we have a fair chance of a decent life. And that question everybody asks themselves, not just the people who come from the southern part of the world. That's what it's about, eye-to-eye -eye approach, eye-to-eye -eye communication, talking to each other, don't give us fish. Don't teach us how to fish. And I say this again and again, for those who have heard me talk before. Ask us if we eat fish. Huh? <laughs> then we can have the conversation. Then we have, and the conversation is going to be heated. It's going to be difficult. It's going to take a while. But that is normal because, to be honest, we are all the same. That's what we teach our young people. There is no difference. Just because you come from Africa doesn't mean you're destined to be poor. You're destined to listen to what comes from the West and take it on because they are that much ahead. They're struggling too. They're trying to change a lot of things that they've done wrong. We have a better chance. This opportunity, we have the digital world. We have that opportunity. We can do it differently. We are informed, much more informed, as young as our countries are, than they were at that time when their countries were that young. So this is an opportunity, and an opportunity not just for, the, for, for us to take our position in the, the world arena, but also for the West to have a different kind of conversation, a different kind of dialogue with us. And that is something where I say my, my final, because I think I've got only a few minutes, is to say that in terms of the media, I have an ask to the media, really, because in all the work that I do and, and, and all of the, the, the events that I visit, I really, really need the media, and I'm saying it really, not just on a personal level, but for hundreds of, of children and young people, and also for a good part of the world that is misrepresented, I really want the conversation to be a lot more honest. Let us deal with the bad bits and the good bits, but tell, tell the truth about things. Don't stigmatize us. Don't make us look as though we are limping, when actually Africa is, the emerging economies, the majority come from that continent. For example, uh, you know? When we have the world's resources, when that continent is still so untapped that agriculturally, a good part of the world is kaput, and everybody's looking towards there because we are the food, ba the, the, the food basket of the world. And we're telling our young people this. And I, we're telling our young people this, and I always tell people because they think, oh, well, she's lived in Europe, she speaks German, and all that sort of stuff. She's a bit different. No, there are thousands of us. I can see quite a few of us here already. There are thousands of, of us who think like me. And we're moving on, and the digital world is helping us. The education through the digital world, this alternative education that we're getting, where you don't need to go into a classroom, is helping so much. This is called, what do they call it? Uh, I got the term recently, hyper-transparency, that is occurring through the, the access to, to the digital world. So the conversation has changed, and especially with the media, they've experienced that, with all the bloggers. You know, conversations around who can say what, and who's qualified to say what. We are all qualified. 
That's the change that's happened through the digital world. And that's what's happened to our education system. And what our work is at Saudi Ku is we're trying to give these young people access to that. We have challenges. Like I said, we don't have the, the mobiles, we don't have the computers yet, we don't have access to, in fact, we have the computers, a few laptops, but access to, inter, to the internet. And that's where it's going to happen. That's where the change is going to happen. And I can't wait until the roaming prices go away completely because the fact that we've been paying for air all this time and this got so expensive it makes it so difficult for us to access information and to exchange information. But all that needs to change and we have to work towards that changing because the conversation is happening already. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Obam. You would have had another three minutes. <laughs> you would have had another three minutes, but that's fine. <laughs>